get started. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to join our Department of Computing Distinguished Seminar Series on Data Science and Intelligence. Uh, thank you for all the friends, colleagues, uh, students, and many guests from uh, mainland China. Thank you for coming. So first of all, uh, our head, uh, Professor Lee, will give an opening uh, speech on this event. Thank you, Song. Yes, good afternoon. So uh, welcome to the uh, Distinguished Seminar Series. As uh, Professor Guo just mentioned, it's, it's a Distinguished Seminar Series on AI and the data science organized by our Department of Computing uh, in conjunction with uh, the Data Science and the AI Lab. Uh, today, we are very pleased and grateful to have Professor Hossein Abbas from the University of New South Wales, Canberra, Australia, to help us uh, kick off this uh, distinguished seminar series by presenting the very first talk in the series. So uh, before starting the uh, formal business, I noticed that uh, you know, over uh, 220 uh, online participants and they, we expect to have more to join us. So maybe let me briefly introduce our department for those of you who are first time to join our event. Uh, our department is uh, one of the oldest compute, uh, computing department in Hong Kong Tertiary Institute. And this year is uh, our 47th anniversary. Uh, the strategic areas of focus in our department are AI, data science, IoT, FinTech, and uh, cybersecurity. And thanks to the continuous strong support from our faculty and the university, our department is now among the largest computer science department in Hong Kong. Uh, with over 50 academic staff members and the annual intake of students, including undergraduate and postgraduate, is over 500. And currently we have over 160 PhD and MPhil students ongoing. Uh, of course, uh, owing to the time limit, I will uh, stop here. But for those of you who are interested in knowing more about our department, what we do and where we stand, uh, you're most welcome to visit our departmental website. So now let me uh, pass the speaker to our seminar DJ, uh, Professor Guo Song, who is our associate head of research uh, to enter into the formal business. Song, please. Thank you, Professor Lee. Um, so uh, before the talk, uh, I just report that so, so far we have four, uh, 240 uh, audience. Uh, thank you all again. So uh, I'd like to give a, a brief introduction of the invited speaker. Uh, professor Hussein Abbas is a full professor in the School of Engineering and Information Technology, University of New South Wales, Canberra. Um, he has been with the university since uh, 2000 and a full professor since 2007. Before joining the university, he was an academic with Cario University since 1995. Before that, he was working for industry in the IT domain. Professor Abbas is a fellow of IEEE, a fellow of the Australian Computer Society, a fellow of UK Operations Research Society, and a fellow of the Australian <laughs> Institute of Managers and Leaders. Professor Abbas is the funding editor-in-chief of the IEEE Transactions on Artificial Intelligence and Associate Editor of a number of IEEE journals and ACM Computing Surveys. In addition to his basic research into AI theory, algorithms, and human AI teaming, he has applied his research to a wide variety of applications, including animal breeding, finance and banking, transportation, robotics, and air traffic control. Professor Abbas is a graduate member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and has served on university and national committees for various strategic roles. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for attention and uh, let us welcome Professor Abbas thank for the you. invited talk. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> 
thank you very much for the invitation and uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be with you today. Uh, so um, I, have, I have many slides as, as, as usual, so I will, I will, I will, I will try to um, uh, cover as much as possible, but if we, if we, if we exceed time, I will, I will stop at any point in time, so that should be fine. So just to kick it off, uh, I, will, um, uh, I will start with the normal disclaimer that everything that I will be saying is, is my own responsibility. Um, and that's, uh, that's not a reflection of, on any of my collaborators or funding agencies. Uh, just like giving you a quick uh, outline of the talk um, for uh, people who are not uh, familiar with the field of artificial intelligence, I will just give a very quick overview uh, about the official purpose of artificial intelligence. Um, I will avoid talking about the philosophy of AI today, uh, but I actually moved the philosophy to the end of the talk. So if we have time, uh, we will get to see some of the philosophical issues of artificial intelligence as well uh, toward the end. Uh, then after that, I will talk to you about the economic implications of artificial intelligence, and I will hopefully try to convince you uh, that artificial intelligence is really one of uh, the main uh, uh, technologies of today that uh, almost everyone is looking at it. And it's, it's a lucky time for artificial intelligence researchers and students to be part of this community. Um, then I will show you some of the applications of AI, uh, but I will be biased. I will be mainly talking about some of the applications that I would lucky to be involved uh, uh, within this application. Uh, so that I am able to tell you some of the underlying techno AI algorithms and methodologies that were used uh, uh, in, in, in some of these applications. And with each application, I will give you an overview about the lesson that I have learned out of them. So I will go back as far as 25 years ago or maybe 28 years ago, um, and I will stop uh, approximately 14 years ago. Uh, so I will, I will stop at this point of time because of the limited time that we have. Um, then I will move into some of the research challenges in artificial intelligence that we are talking about today. Um, and I will be mainly focusing on some of the algorithmic challenges as well as some of the social integration challenges of AI. Um, then I will conclude uh, the talk with the social challenges uh, for artificial intelligence. And that is the time I will get back to some of the philosophical discussions and the philosophical origin of, uh, of, of, of AI. Uh, then I will conclude with some of the take home messages. So let us, uh, let us kick it off. And uh, some of uh, the slides you will see um, uh, a reference at the bottom of the slide uh, that you are welcome to have a look to get a little bit more information about the details if you are interested in these details. So some of the, my initial discussion have been covered in uh, the first editorial in the IEEE transaction uh, on artificial intelligence, uh, uh, which, uh, which appeared uh, uh, in, uh, at the end of 2020. So that is classically, when we talk about the purpose of artificial intelligence, that is classically the paper that we would normally start with. Um, in my next editorial in the transaction, I will go much earlier than that. I will go actually back almost 2000 years ago. Uh, so look, look for this editorial uh, uh, to, to, to see some of the very early uh, uh, discussions on AI. Uh, but that is normally the paper that we would normally look at when we are talking about the purpose of artificial intelligence. And that is Alan Turing in his first paper um, uh, titled Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And the first section is a very famous imitation game, which I have a slide on it. Uh, my next slide will be on the imitation game, which is the test of or the classic test for intelligence uh, that we would be using. And if you really look at the first line, uh, uh, in, uh, in choosing paper, you would see what he has written. I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And you would be surprised when you start reading this paper, you would imagine that 
strong, have strong views about the ability of machines uh, to think, but I encourage you to look at this paper. It's an open uh, source paper that anyone can download uh, without, without the need to uh, log in into any particular library. And it's a really nice paper to read. So I encourage, especially PhD students working on AI, uh, to start looking at this paper to get to see some of the initial thought processes that went into uh, uh, the development of AI. And Alan Turing is uh, quite famous for this tooling test. Uh, with the tooling test, um, I asked the question, how do I know that uh, a machine would be, would be uh, intelligent? So we need to have a test for that. And uh, interestingly, the first version of Alan Turing test was looking at having a, a human sitting in the middle. I call it the interrogator. This interrogator will be asking questions. And what we have on the right and left hand side, the first version that Alan Turing talked about is a male and a female. Um, and he said, whether the interrogator is actually able to, dis to distinguish between the two. Uh, the interrogator needs to ask them question, and at the end, uh, uh, this person in the middle needs to decide if that is a male or a female. Then after that, what's going to happen if we exchange one of these layers with a machine? So instead of having a male, uh, I would have a machine, or instead of having the female, I would have the machine, and the question will change from if this is a male or a female to another question, is that is a human or a machine? So this test has been criticized uh, a, a lot in the literature, despite that it is, it is one of the most uh, well-established tests for uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, you can get to see some of the criticism in the first chapter uh, in, one of my, uh, in one of my books. Then we'll move on in time, uh, 1956, uh, that was considered as the first uh, potentially official meeting that called for the establishment of a field called artificial intelligence, uh, which was a meeting organized by four of uh, uh, key people uh, really uh, uh, in, uh, in, in their own field from uh, computer architectures and, and, and networking to, uh, cognitive, uh, to cognitive science to information theory. And again, if you start looking at the proposal that uh, these people put to establish, uh, 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 to call for funding for a workshop uh, that they met and established the field of AI, uh, uh, you will get to see what I have highlighted in the green uh, uh, light, uh, in the green color. And the key about that is what I have uh, highlighted in a blue color. And looking at the change that happened for home Alan Turing paper talking about can a machine think to the change here that at, about artificial intelligence, uh, whether we can actually simulate intelligence uh, using a machine. There's a change of language and, 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 and that in its own right, I can, I can talk about it for a long time, the difference between Alan Turing uh, question and the way the concept of artificial intelligence was born uh, in, uh, and in, in this proposal. So we we'll move from cognition about thinking uh, into simulating uh, uh, cognition uh, uh, pretty much. So let me move away from these early days into what, what, what is artificial intelligence. And uh, as I said in the next editorial for the transaction, I will be talking about that in detail. But instead of giving you definitions today, I will just give you uh, 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 an overview of the field uh, from a technology perspective. So normally we'll would be talking about artificial intelligence to predict something. So within the data science, um, this is the data science seminar. we we'll would be talking about using uh, AI to predict the stock market, or I would be using uh, AI to predict the uh, market segment that I should be uh, I should be sending ads uh, through and, and, and so on. So there's an element of prediction. There's an element of decision-making as well. And that's quite, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, common when we're talking about robotics, getting uh, artificial intelligence to get 
uh, robot to, uh, uh, to move uh, and, and, and make decisions. There's also an element of interaction uh, that this AI uh, is not going to be on its own in that environment. It's not going to be socially isolated AI. This AI is going to be socially integrated with all it is interaction with other artificial intelligence agents or this interaction is uh, with humans. But underneath all of that, there's a fundamental concept of understanding that I would like this AI to be able to understand something. So there's a fundamental concept of understanding that's sitting uh, uh, underneath that. And if these are the four main dimensions that uh, we, would, we, would, we would think about the use of AI uh, uh, technologically, uh, then we we'll start looking at the technology, the techniques. Uh, so as computer scientists, we would be interested in the algorithmic side of that. So what type of algorithms we would be using? And quite interestingly, it's, it's almost the same technology that we might be using in each of these dimensions. I might be using an artificial neural network to do prediction. I might be using artificial neural network to, to do planning uh, uh, or to do uh, decision-making. I might, I might be using it as we would see, for example, in today, uh, deep learning for natural language processing would be using an artificial intelligence to do translation, to do uh, compositional AI. Uh, so some of our compositional AI technology are still based on neural networks sitting underneath it. So many of these algorithmic uh, sides of AI could be used pretty much for uh, almost uh, any of, uh, uh, of, of, of these particular uh, technological use of artificial intelligence. And sitting underneath that, uh, we go to the classic, uh, the main challenge of artificial intelligence. If you are coming from a classic AI, uh, and uh, what, what I mean was that uh, you have studied artificial intelligence as symbolic artificial intelligence, non-symbolic artificial intelligence, you went into logic and so on you will get to see that one of the main challenges for artificial intelligence is representation, representation, representation. How to represent the knowledge. Uh, it is the challenge that we are talking about today when we are talking about deep artificial neural network. We are looking at the architecture, we're looking at the activation function. Uh, we are looking at aspects of uh, representation. It is a challenge if I would like to use classic logic, whether I'm using uh, 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 propositional logic, first order logic, higher order logic, symbolic logic, and, and, and so on. Again, I need to make decisions about the representation. And there are aspects of obviously machine learning. When we talk about artificial intelligence, we are talking about learning, and learning is the ability of the machine to improve performance based on experience. So machine learning is, is, is a big uh, 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 elephant in, uh, in the AI sphere. Uh, in addition to the planning and the optimization, the decision-making uh, uh, aspect of that. So this is a slide pretty much summarized for us to see the uh, potentially the landscape of AI uh, from an algorithmic level as well as from the practical use uh, uh, level. So let me now take you into you know, why, 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 why AI is, is the flavor of the month. Uh, uh, so uh, look at this MIT technology review, uh, pretty much many of the techniques that we're talking about today, uh, uh, they were invented 25 years ago, uh, uh, in nine, uh, actually uh, longer than that, even in, in, in 1950s and earlier, uh, in, in terms of the initial philosophy of them. Uh, this, this, these techniques are not, are not really uh, new. But what happened in the last 10, 15 years is the revolution in our computational infrastructure, uh, the GBUs, which allowed the neural networks to speed up computation, um, uh, the uh, uh, multi-core uh, 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 DCs that uh, pretty much uh, made a significant amount of computational infrastructure available to PhD students in the lab when this infrastructure was not, was not really accessible uh, by, uh, by common people. And when we start looking at cloud computing and when we start looking at 
uh, uh, lots of uh, the other advances uh, that happened uh, in, uh, in computer science uh, from computer networking and uh, uh, cloud and, 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 and the, whole, the whole suite of intelligence uh, is, is, is based um, or was enabled by uh, uh, the, uh, the diverse uh, fields uh, and subfields in computer science from databases to, uh, to cloud, uh, to uh, networking, uh, to uh, uh, GPUs, uh, uh, FPGAs, and, and so on. So you get to see that there's almost like an exponential increase uh, in that happened in this uh, in this short time frame, which resulted in uh, significant uh, capabilities uh, available yeah. computationally yeah. for uh, for artificial intelligence yeah. to advance. Yeah. Now, when we start looking also at what the economics of AI and the implication of that internationally, uh, you get to see that there's almost an exponential growth that's going to happen very soon. Uh, in the number of publications on artificial intelligence. So I will flip these slides very quickly. This is the Stanford uh, 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 AI index report, which came a couple of months ago, and it has all the statistics that I'll be talking about today uh, uh, to you. So looking at the increase in the number of uh, journal papers in AI from 2019, 19.6% 19 uh, increase. And we are talking about publication in the thousands here. So look at the y-axis. Uh, we are talking about close to 80,000 journal papers got published in 2020 uh, uh, that, with, that have some aspect to do with AI. That's a significant number of journal publications. Just to make a claim that for anyone to make a claim that they are uh, sitting uh, on the top of this field is, 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 uh, is, is a challenge. But that is not just about academic publications. Uh, look at the AI hiring index by, by country. There is artificial intelligence is almost taking over in terms of the job market. Uh, this is an index. Uh, so this index is relative to all other jobs which are available in the market. Uh, so that is uh, an index which is formulated based on AI jobs against every other job. And you get to see that many of the countries, uh, pretty much uh, Brazil, India, Canada, Singapore, uh, all the way uh, uh, to France and China, uh, the applications of artificial intelligence is outspreading. Uh, and the job market is booming, uh, looking for talents in artificial intelligence. Uh, when we start looking at the investment, again, uh, the AI index uh, in by, by Stanford, uh, you get again to see uh, the significant increase in private investment in artificial intelligence. Uh, what we are looking at here is in millions of US dollars. So when you see 67,000 uh, uh, over here as a total, that is actually $67 billion, which went into AI investment in 2020 uh, alone. And you get to see some, something like COVID has not really stopped uh, uh, the increase uh, in artificial intelligence investment. Now, when we move to look at the private investment in funded AI companies, again, it's a continuous increase. And again, you get to see the top 10 countries uh, uh, that are investing heavily uh, in, 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 in AI. Uh, we are talking here uh, in the order of uh, billions of dollar investment uh, in artificial intelligence. So where this investment is going? I mean, this investment is not uh, obviously just going into a bunch of computer scientists uh, who would like to develop new algorithms. These investments are going into computer systems that help people, uh, help the society. So looking at the different uh, 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 industries which uh, are uh, consuming uh, artificial intelligence, uh, it's, it's no surprise to get to see that the top industry is in the health domain. Drugs, cancer, um, uh, uh, drug discovery, uh, there's a significant increase and obviously we could contribute some to that to COVID, uh, COVID uh, in 2020 in uh, investing AI for health. Uh, but that's not just for health. Uh, 
look at uh, uh, using artificial intelligence for education, there is a significant increase in the AI technology that is uh, uh, that uh, we are using to support uh, delivering education in uh, universities and schools and uh, the uh, student analytics uh, type of work, and all the way down to uh, looking at semiconductors, uh, you know, the classic. Uh, and obviously computer games and shopping and, 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 and so on. So every industry is, is, is leveraging uh, the advances that we are creating as AI researchers uh, so that it can benefit uh, the social good uh, for the society. And you, some, of, some of you might, might, might think and say, of course, I mean, that's deep learning. Um, so I want you to look at this and I want you to pay attention to this column here, uh, which is really talking about, uh, um, about uh, uh, other, other techniques other than machine learning. And you will, you, you, you will get to see, for example, if you look at the automotive and assembly industry, yes, 19% of that is, is in deep learning, but 27% of that is non-deep learning algorithm. Um, obviously, it's it's really difficult here because some of the natural language uh, uh, algorithms that we are talking about here and some of the computer uh, uh, vision uh, may have some deep learning setting beneath that. So it's quite difficult to draw uh, uh, hard boundaries uh, between these different uses. But as an indication, it's not, it's not everything is, 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 is deep learning in the market. And I will talk to that uh, in, in, in the application. So let me very quickly uh, take you back uh, uh, in a journey in my life uh, in applying artificial intelligence in different domains. And I will, I will, I will, I will flash these slides uh, very quickly to get to some of the interesting uh, basic science questions that we are faced with today. So go back all the way to 1993 and uh, 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 one of the problems that I worked uh, on uh, with another colleagues, uh, we wanted to design uh, a solution for garbage collection. And the lesson that I have learned out of this is economic values get lost when we are solving the problem only once. So let me explain to you what the problem was. So at the time I was in Egypt and one of the main problems is collecting, collecting uh, solid waste and collecting rubbish and so on. So obviously uh, this was not the map that I used, that's just a map that I got from the internet to, to, to give you an image of what the problem is. And in this particular case, we needed to actually uh, look at the suburb and we needed to schedule vehicles and we needed to study the flow uh, uh, in, 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 in this suburb. So we looked at vehicle routing and vehicle scheduling problem and we wanted to solve that. And at the time, uh, uh, two people uh, pretty much um, uh, loved something called calculus and mathematics and optimization. Uh, uh, fully understood the algorithms and the mathematics behind that, were ready to go and apply this uh, uh, fantastic mathematics to this problem. And guess what? 95% of the time that we spent had nothing to do with the mathematics. We got a map that uh, looked, actually the map that I'm showing you on the screen uh, looks much better than the map that we got. And we discovered that our first problem is that how can I actually extract any information from this map to establish the network that I can get actually my vehicle to traverse? Uh, how can I establish the graph that, you know, we, we started uh, uh, our graph theory and, and all the math looks nice, but where would you get this graph from? Uh, you need to digitize this map and you need to collect the data. And we spend 95% of our time uh, to, to do that. But why this was important economically, it has a very high economic value. Anyone would understand just uh, the value of collecting this garbage. Uh, it's, it has health implication, uh, it has social implication, it has uh, a pretty much uh, a implication on the society. Uh, so the economic value was extremely high. So we spent so much time uh, digitizing that, collecting data, solving the problem with our VCs at the time, which were, uh, I'm not going to say which type of VC. I think many of the young people would be uh, uh, laughing at me if I tell you what VC we used, but we created economic value. 
but it was lost. And it was lost because we went and we give the council, uh, the, 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 uh, the city council, uh, we, we give them the solution. And once you give them the solution, they start implementing it. And the following day, the problem had to change somehow. And now you need to do all of that again. You need to get these experts in optimization uh, who are willing to spend 95% of the time to, uh, 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 to digitize a new, a, a new map and enter the data from scratch and all of this stuff. And who's going to pay for that? So you get to see here that one of the lessons that we learned very early in the days is that never try to solve this problem once, even so that it, it's going, you will pay for the cost for that. That's not a good thing to do. Then I will move to 1996, where I had another problem. And that problem was uh, in chemical process engineering. Uh, we were looking at uh, something called heat exchanger networks. And the mathematics, uh, is not enough. Uh, that is the lesson that I have learned from this problem. Again, uh, but from a different perspective that I will talk to you about. So that was a problem that we were looking at at the time. Uh, heat exchanger networks, think of them as flow of cold and heat. And when these flow meet each other, so you have pipes and you might have hot water and cold water flowing in this pipe. And when the hot stream meets the cold stream, they will exchange energy. So heat exchanger networks is, 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 is a significant technology used especially you know, for uh, cold countries, but also in, in, in certain type of industries, uh, very significant technology. And quite easy to come and say, if I have an, a new network that I would like to design, uh, we, have, we have mathematical models to do this design. But the challenge here is that in the city, uh, at the time I was in Edinburgh, uh, they, they, had, uh, they, they, they had existing networks. So you can't really just design it from scratch. What you are stuck with is the existing network infrastructure that you have. And you need to do what we call retrofitting. Minimum changes in the network to improve the performance in the network. And that has a extreme economic values, uh, very high economic values in terms of saving energy and so on. Um, so that is that is uh, some of uh, the things that we used to play with. Now, for people who are uh, in the AI field, uh, especially in the optimization field, that's a problem which you can model it as a, a highly nonlinear uh, problem. It satisfies Lipschitz uh, condition, uh, which means that I can use things like successive quadratic programming to solve my nonlinear optimization problem. So quadratic solvers uh, is really gold in many of the nonlinear optimization problems that are differentiable and fit, 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 fit this type of problem. Um, and obviously, because uh, this is, uh, there are thermodynamics uh, involved, so you can model that as constraints. But to get a solution for this type of problems, uh, what discover that what are missing out is that there is a huge domain knowledge which are available within the designer that we could leverage to bootstrap solutions in my quadratic programming solver. So instead of waiting for hours or days or months to get a solution, I could actually bootstrap solutions very quickly by using some of the domain knowledge of the engineer. Uh, this engineer didn't really use this quadratic programming solvers they actually use some rule of thumb. And these are examples of the rule of thumbs that we, uh, I had to go in, in this particular case, I was, I, I was doing, I was the main person on the problem. So I had to go for knowledge acquisition, uh, uh, techniques, uh, interviewing, discussing with the domain expert and extracting this type of heuristics. And obviously I needed to find a way to actually boot classic optimization with logic, but most of these heuristics were encoded as uh, as predicate logic, and we had we had to use a technology called constraint logic programming, which at the time I was I was quite expert in in that technology, working with it for almost ten years before getting to this uh, uh, problem. So we learned the lesson. We learned the lesson when we were looking at mathematical optimization as an AI specialist. I understood. Mathematical optimization was transparent for me. I understood every step in the quadratic programming solver 
because I had to re-implement a quadratic programming solver in full screen logic programming. And for anyone working with quadratic programming will understand that this is an extremely challenging task because of numerical instability that you could generate because of one million things that can go wrong in the design of this solver. But for me, the technology was transparent. For the user, this technology is complete black box. Nobody really understood what's coming out of this mathematical optimization problem. For the heuristics, the heuristics were transparent for me. I understood them because I went and I did the knowledge acquisition. The user also understood the heuristic uh, that, uh, that, that we came up with. But when we look at the quality of the solution, my quadratic programming solver, I was able to give bounds on the quality of the solution. I could give uh, bounds on the optimality for the user. That's a costly solution because it took time to get a solution out of the system. The heuristics, I can't guarantee that they will always work. Uh, for the user, the heuristic made sense. It's what they call fit for purpose. Uh, they are sufficient because what the user was after is to give the user a better solution, not necessarily to give the user the optimal solution. And at this point of time, I learned the lesson that mathematics is not enough. Uh, there is something called the user and what this user needs uh, is, is, is really important in the equation. And what we need to take into account when we are designing this system is the opportunity that logic-based solution and uh, uh, especially if we're talking about heuristics encoded as a knowledge base uh, is, 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 is important to work hand in hand with the calculus-based optimization. I move in time to 1998 when looking at, uh, at, at, at animal genetics and the idea was in, in the artificial intelligence program looking at analyzing a, a, a database of uh, 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 the genes coming from cows and goats. Uh, and what one uh, of the main lessons that I have learned is admit it. It doesn't need to be that machine learning is going to be better than every classic algorithm that we have. If machine learning does not work, admit it to the sponsor or to the, to the user because there's no point of using something less efficient. So what was the problem? The problem had great economic values uh, 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 in, at the time in, in farms in Australia. We had uh, close to 14,000 farms. We are talking about $3 billion in, uh, in the wholesale uh, uh, for, uh, for the milk uh, pro uh, value in, in Australia. A significant problem. Uh, but when you start analyzing some of the data at the time uh, that I spent months to extract this data from an Oracle database and to clean it and to do all the data science stuff. Um, and you end up modeling that. You discover that classically, when people talk about using linear models in that domain, they, don't, they did not mean classic linear regression models. What they were talking about is something called generalized linear models. These are highly nonlinear models and they are extremely efficient to construct uh, uh, quite similar to radial basis function, or if you are talking about kernels in support vector machines, uh, or, or whatever your favorite technique and doing transformation is. So when you start looking at that, the Bayesian network that we built at the time and the neural network could not really compete uh, in accuracy and efficiency against that. So we had we had to switch uh, to switch tactic and we start looking at. Uh, other aspects of the problem, looking at the classification side and the neural network and the Bayesian networks were performing extremely well on the classification problem, but not on the point prediction problem. And we'll start looking at providing a system as a solution, not just a model, but a system, a system that combined data mining with optimization with simulation. Now I am running out of time, so I will start speeding a little bit faster going into some of my uh, uh, early days on campus, uh, looking at uh, uh, RoboSoco. Um, and I'm not expecting that the frame of the video will come to you clearly, 
but again, uh, very quickly, what we learned in this experience designing this type of algorithms to play uh, uh, RoboSoccer, uh, if you get to see the real video, uh, you will get to see that the ball will move faster. So you may not be able to catch this if you have a low network connection, but this, 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 this type of algorithms, you get to see that they are actually not sufficient. Uh, as soon as you start touching something in robotic, you are dealing with a system and designing an algorithm does not solve the problem. You need to think of the system as a whole and reality is messy and you need to be able to deal with this mess. With this mess. Uh, another problem which I will escape is in an air traffic control. That's a problem which took significant amount of uh, uh, of my life uh, to many years to uh, contribute to that domain. And again, uh, uh, the lessons that I have learned out of this is uh, uh, you could come up with win-win solution for everyone. Um, saving the environment does not mean loss of uh, monetary value. Uh, saving the environment can also save can also save money. Um, and the other thing that we've learned in this problem is that it's not always about solving problems. Sometimes finding problems is more interesting uh, uh, problem definition. So that's that's a problem which pretty much captured almost uh, every type of AI that you can think about for home uh, uh, classic uh, 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 trajectory planning, uh, flow management, uh, to all the way to actually dealing with EEG data and uh, uh, human uh, integration, integrating human brain in the air traffic control environment. Um, and I will conclude the last problem uh, uh, to talk to you about today uh, is a problem that we looked at in early 2007 and this problem while well, still looking at it, how to connect the human brain to the machine uh, uh, or to the AI. Um, and uh, that's, that was some of the early work that we've, we've, we've done uh, looking at uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the work with EEG data. Let me, let me now share with you, uh, moving away from application into research challenges, uh, so let me share with you quickly a few research challenges uh, which uh, we are faced with today. Um, data science, uh, we are looking at how to dis automatically discover associations in the data. Uh, causal inferencing and causal networks, uh, this, is, this is really a hot topic and it's a very difficult topic. You can't just screw a technique at this topic uh, 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 to, 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 to solve it. Uh, but we've contributed to some of the algorithmic development uh, of, uh, of, of, of this type of uh, uh, dynamic and automatic uh, uh, generation of relationships. So for example, uh, what I am showing you on the screen is one of our most recent paper, uh, which is a generalization of the autoencoder that can uh, discover uh, uh, relationships between, between variables and you could use this to, uh, uh, to reconstruct uh, some of the missing data that you have, uh, and uh, you could use it for other purposes as well. Uh, another, another problem, which is uh, a fascinating one, uh, which is driven by deep learning, uh, for people who are working with deep learning, uh, today we are talking about the ability to feed a whole graph. Uh, into a neural network. It's no longer the old days that we have to extract features and uh, we make these features independent of each other. Uh, our ability to deal with complex data structure uh, as an input to a neural network. Uh, what I'm showing you is looking at the graph convolution neural networks, but let us, let us start thinking about you know, a different type of uh, complex data structure. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a challenge that we are faced with today, uh, how we can actually feed this type of complex data structure into our neural network. Now, I will start moving now from this algorithmic uh, uh, perspective to AI into some of the social integration. And trust is a huge topic. Uh, you could have the best algorithm that you can ever design, 
but if the user is not going to trust that, nobody's going to use it. So what is trust? Just to unfold the concept of trust. We work significantly on this topic, uh, looking at trust. And the more you start looking at trust, you'll discover that it is not just a sim simple equation that you come up with uh, that you think that you've solved the trust. It is, again, a system that we need, we, need, we need to look at. And I invite you to look at this topic because it is fascinating. You can contribute to it, whether you are a social scientist, uh, whether you are a psychologist, uh, and whether you are a computer scientist who is interested in developing algorithms. Uh, it, is, it is one of the biggest challenge in AI today. And obviously the classic uh, challenge that everyone is talking about, uh, explainable AI. Uh, uh, back uh, almost uh, 10 years ago in our system, we were delivering explainable AI. We did not talk about it as explainable AI, but we talked about it in terms of taking the user into the design. So that's the air traffic controller and the air traffic controller is getting uh, 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 an advice from the recommender system. And what is sitting behind that field of optimization and computer science algorithm. Uh, but, but the user does not understand that. The user needs to learn English to be able to deal with that. And that's uh, some of our most recent work about uh, explainable uh, uh, artificial intelligence coming up with the architecture, how we can actually design uh, the integrated system uh, this is a paper uh, which has been accepted in the IEEE CEA Journal of uh, Automatica uh, Synexia, and it's available uh, uh, online. Uh, the future of, uh, of, of, of AI, uh, another uh, series of challenges. Now, I'm not going to talk to you about that. That's a paper which has been accepted, but it's under embargo at the moment, so I can't talk about it until the journal uh, makes it available online, uh, but it's a clinging element of interpretability, explainability, predictability, and all the way to achieve a stable human AI uh, uh, theming. And I invite you to keep, to keep an eye on my publication list in, on my web uh, page uh, to see when this paper is out. There are philosophical aspects in the paper that uh, 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 if, if, if you, need, you need to be patient with the philosophy, but there are also some uh, form and mathematical definition that you would be interested to look at. So how to watch this space? So my, my suggestion is watch out this space of the future of AI. Uh, the RGBD Competition Intelligence Society uh, is, is, is one of uh, the pioneers in societies in, in that field. Uh, neural network, fuzzy, evolutionary computation, swarm intelligence, these are the technology that the RGBD Competition Intelligence Society has been looking at. But the society is evolving very fast. And what we are doing in the society and what we are bringing to you is not just what you've seen up to now, which I'm showing you, for example, some of the journals, transaction on neural network, transaction on fuzzy, uh, some of the top transactions in, uh, in RGBE and in the world in the field of AI. Uh, we are doing more than that. So watch out the space and you will get to see uh, some exciting stuff coming out of IEEE CIS. So I have one minute to talk to you about the social challenges uh, uh, for AI uh, to allow for Q&A. Uh, so I will skip these slides, uh, uh, but uh, it's not because they are not important, because they deserve a, a whole hour in their own right. Uh, but artificial intelligence does not stop at the hand of a computer scientist writing an algorithm. Uh, this is just the starting point of the story taking this algorithm from the lab into something that is beneficial for the society is a whole process with its own challenges. And we can't just leave it to uh, 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 salespeople to do because some of these challenges touches on our core business in, our, in, in computer science and AI. To us, ethics, the legality, the humanity, and I, 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 I talk about all of that from a social integration uh, perspective. Uh, job losses, and uh, uh, I will, uh, I just would like to take, uh, if you don't mind, one minute to talk about, about uh, uh, this uh, uh, philosophical uh, issue. Uh, and, and hopefully that I will show you at the end of that is 
maybe singularity is coming. Um, and I will show you why uh, this. So let me, let me do this using classic logic. I will start with an axiom and I will use uh, BAI, that is before artificial intelligence, uh, because all the slides that I will use to create these axioms are actually before Alan Turing uh, talked uh, about uh, machine thinking. I will go back to Aristotle, uh, who said, who pretty much invented the modus ponens. That's one of the basic concepts. If you study logic, uh, uh, you will you will be familiar with it in deductive logic. Uh, so modus ponens, uh, modus ponens is uh, one of uh, uh, one of the things that we use for inferences. So keep this rule uh, or this axiom in mind. I will just call it an axiom. I will go then to René Descartes, uh, who said, "I think, therefore I am." So his axiom is cognition is existence. How do I know that I exist? I know that I exist because I can think, because I have cognition. So keep this in mind as an axiom, cognition is existence. Now, all of these five axioms, you will find them in the, editor in the first editorial of the IEEE transaction on EI. So uh, you could go and read, uh, and also in the next editorial. Moving from that to David Hume, who I have, I was fortunate to write a whole paper about, about uh, causality and disagreement about causality, who said that cognition is computation. Moving to uh, George Bully, who uh, invented Boolean logic, who demonstrated that and, or, and not are sufficient op uh, operator for universal computation. So I can, I can compute any function using this three operator. Maybe the formula will look very ugly, but still I can. And I will end up with uh, the last axiom uh, from Herbert Simon, who said that the real complexity is not coming from the agent. The real complexity is coming from the environment. The agent is simple. The complexity is due to the environment. Now, let us put all of these axioms uh, uh, together. Cognition is existence. Cognition is computation, or and and not are sufficient for universal computations. So what do I deduce out of that? That these three logical operators are sufficient to model existence. And if they are, then the AI that I am developing, machine cognition, implies AI existence. And if AI exists, then human versus AI race is likely to lead to singularity. Now, this is a whole philosophical discussion, but I wanted to leave you with a bit of philosophy um, and um, just debouting from the economics and the algorithmic side of AI. So maybe singularity is imminent, uh, but, but it's definitely far away. Uh, we, are not, we are not ready for that yet. And I don't think we have the technology to claim that we are close to that. But uh, we have uh, uh, we have history in philosophy to demonstrate that this is not just an imagination. There are uh, uh, axioms behind it. So my take-home message to you today: AI can be applied anywhere uh, with significant socioeconomic. I told you today, I showed you that we can apply it for collecting garbage all the way to very sophisticated socio-technical systems. Uh, there are many. The social challenge is beyond deep learning. So please think outside the box. Uh, deep learning is not everything in AI. Uh, social integration and implication of AI will remain uh, at a challenge for many years to come. And people who are working with deep learning, if you can actually use deep learning to solve some of this social integration and implication of AI problem, this is, this is, this is, this is a magnificent uh, area that really needs some of the architectures in deep learning to, uh, uh, to, to look at. And uh, my last advice, submit your, bus, your, your, your best work uh, to the IEEE transaction on AI. Uh, I welcome uh, your submission. Uh, we are getting a large number of submissions and it's, it's a very tough uh, uh, competitive uh, uh, process, uh, but we are looking for submission that is, is, is going to change the field and is going to contribute to the evolution of the field. And with that, I thank you so much for the invitation. Again, I'm more than happy to take questions, uh, but I'm conscious that we also have
few minutes left, so I'm happy for anyone to email me your questions if we don't have time to discuss them today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Abbas. Uh, so far, we have uh, 320 some uh, audience. I think the uh, talk is very successful. It's very uh, inspiring and very informative and with uh, lots of examples. Um, I think uh, this talk uh, not just uh, show us uh, many um, um, frontier technologies, but also a uh, very educational for uh, the new PhD students. So uh, in the later on um, question to answer uh, session, uh, please uh, two ways of raising your questions. Either you just input uh, your questions in the chat room, and then I will uh, read the questions for you. And then Professor Abbas will uh, address uh, the, the questions. Or if you would like to say something, um, please raise your hand uh, in, in, the, in the Zoom. And then uh, after I call in your name, and please um, un unmute yourself. All right? Now, uh, let us uh, thank Professor Abbas uh, for the wonderful talk uh, before we start starting the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. OK, so I got the first question uh, from uh, Ding, Ding Yi Ling. Okay. Uh, the question is, is statistics knowledge prerequisite to learning the AI algorithms? <clears throat> Thank you. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's an, excellent, uh, an excellent question. Um, and thank you for making it very concrete. Uh, that is the need to what what are the type of the real requisite knowledge to learn algorithms in artificial intelligence. Um, I would I would I would say artificial intelligence algorithms are like uh, uh, any, uh, any 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 computer science algorithm. Uh, there are basics that we need to learn, uh, and that are extremely useful uh, in statistics. Uh, obviously, when you look at uh, things like uh, uh, probabilities, uh, Bayesian statistics, um, but also calculus, uh, we need to have uh, some fundamental understanding of uh, calculus, differentiation, integration, and most of these mathematical concepts, whether they are, we are talking about, you know, uh, uh, linear algebra, calculus, uh, probability theory, uh, and, and, and so on, they are, um, uh, I, I always say, this is the type of knowledge that you will never waste in your life because they are not just critical for learning how to design an algorithm in artificial intelligence. They are applicable everywhere. Uh, so in statistics, definitely I would, I would, I would say uh, we, we need, we need, we need uh, to learn some statistics and obviously machine learning, there are uh, uh, many statistical inferencing techniques uh, that if you would like to understand them, you need to have some basic understanding of uh, statistics at least. Okay, thank you. Uh, because of time, I, I, I think we, 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 we just jump into the next question. Uh, if uh, students or uh, colleagues uh, would like to have follow up questions, just please leave your message. So the second question is from Yu, Yu Ming. Uh, are you going to speak out? Uh, if you want to say, uh, please unmute yourself and uh, raise your question. Okay, thank the chairman. So um, uh, thank the professor uh, Abbas for your uh, wonderful talk. So uh, my question is not currently we talk about the AI, mostly focus on the weak AI. So how about the strong AI? So uh, what are the main challenges along this direction at the current stage? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the strong AI, uh, obviously I touched a little bit uh, uh, about that. And I think I, think I can, um, I don't have time to talk about my philosophical perspective about the use of the concept of weak and strong, but I, I believe I understand what you, what, what you are saying. I would say that um, uh, the, main, the main challenge for strong AI uh, remain to be computational complexity. 
so uh, computational complexity is a still a uh, bottom a bottleneck uh, in, uh, uh, in 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 the implementation, uh, and without without overcoming this computational complexity issues, I think I think uh, uh, we will we will need we will need a little bit more time to see a strong AI. Uh, uh, in, on the same level of performance uh, that we've, uh, we've seen uh, weak, weak, weak AI uh, uh, has, has, has achieved. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next question is from An, An Zhengling. Uh, the question is, the currently many powerful AI projects require numerous, numerous computing resources. It is much difficult for small groups to follow those huge projects. What is your advice for them? My advice uh, is really simple about that. Uh, look, look at any, any person next to you, look at yourself in the mirror. Our intelligence is within a very small volume called our brain. Um, real intelligence, uh, one of the definition of intelligence is about compression. So if you would like to achieve, achieve real intelligence, uh, the lack of computational resources might be your opportunity to think about how you can actually compete with this uh, uh, computationally powerful solution, which are leveraging the computational power uh, how can you can come up with a design that you can achieve similar performance with less computational power? Uh, I think I think that's going to advance the field uh, because we can't just throw everything at more powerful machines uh, 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 to solve. Uh, we will be reaching a limit uh, in 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 our ability to solve these problems. Uh, so I would say. Uh, uh, Use use what's available to you, and innovate uh, how you could how you could design better methods with the computations available to you and the infrastructure available to you. Thank you. Uh, we have lots of questions. I have to move on. So next question is from Ken Amir. Um, the question is: So far, we have seen the positive aspects of AI. Uh, please share your comments on the dark or negative side of AI. Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a fantastic question. I had uh, I had some slides. I I labeled them the ugly AI, and I did not <laughs> talk about that today. Uh, so thank you for bringing up uh, the question. Uh, obviously, uh, 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 some of the social implications of AI. Uh, the, the good thing is that uh, the that's what I would call the bad side of AI uh, is not really that bad. So you start looking at, for example, the implication of AI on, uh, on, 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 on people's life, uh, bias, uh, thrownness, or, un, uh, or unthrownness, uh, some of the misuses of artificial intelligence. Uh, I think with, uh, uh, with, with most of these issues that could lead to uh, misuse of, uh, of, 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 of AI, uh, as AI researchers, it's our social responsibility to understand the issue and 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 and, and, and solving solving it. Uh, I had a slide, for example, about uh, uh, Nick Kasper, uh, 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 and I had other slides. Uh, for example, Chris, uh, the, the Chris Leo talked about, uh, you know. Um, uh, he was the first one uh, who got impacted uh, uh, with artificial intelligence when AI uh, uh, won uh, chess, he retired. Uh, so he lost his job. Uh, and I think his perspective was, is really interesting, which was published in the Wired magazine uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, he said that the problem is not really with, with AI. The problem is that 98% or 97%, I can't remember the exact percentage, of the jobs that we are doing as, 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 as humans uh, are jobs which could be automated. And what we need to do is to start thinking about creating more jobs for humans that rely on our human abilities to think and create rather than doing the same thing over and over and over that automation can do on our behalf. So there are uh, social implications of AI, but I am an optimist and I believe that there are also social fixes 
for these social implications. And the AI community, uh, including myself, uh, we, 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 we are really looking into that. Um, and we believe that many of these challenges uh, uh, will, 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 will be solved, but, but, but we, have, we have to keep, to keep working on these challenges. Thank you. Um, so next question from Ren Chan. Um, please unmute yourself and speak out. Hi, uh, Professor, can you hear me? Uh, yes. I can uh, Professor you. Arbas, uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Actually, uh, I've been serving at the EE for TI for a year now with you. Uh, during the year, I, I can see the fast development of the journal. Uh, so uh, the question is kind of uh, uh, general. Uh, for myself, I've been working mainly in EC, EC area. So we try to build uh, versatile algorithms for solving black box problems. But um, sometimes when people talk about AI, they would like to put it in some application scenarios. So I wonder if it's the right direction to work towards, uh, towards gen general AI or shall we uh, work towards some AI specified for different applications. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Ran. It's really uh, great opportunity to talk to you uh, and hear your voice today. So <clears throat> the choice, the choice of the direction. There are many, many aspects that uh, that that influence this choice. Uh, I would say, as a researcher, you should choose the direction which you really enjoy. Um, because <laughs> you. You, need, you need to choose something that uh, you believe in and you enjoy and, and you can innovate. So, but I understand that, that obviously there are other, other pressures on us as academics that influence our decisions. So applications, I think, is um, uh, a, a huge opportunity for uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, the challenge uh, for whom uh, 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 for whom publishing about the application that I could I could comment on uh, is that when people send a paper about an application of an AI algorithm, um, normally they would they would uh, be positioning it as uh, I have I have I have this algorithm that I've been working on and I have this application and I apply yeah, it yeah. and it works. Uh, and, and, and that does not really advance uh, uh, knowledge much. Uh, I think within the transaction, we extremely welcome applications, but the people needs to highlight what was the challenge. Uh, what is the difference between, you know, getting a, a graduate who learned about neural networks or deep neural network and we give them some images and they applied the deep neural network on the images and they got Two percent improvement. Uh, that that's great, uh, but but to qualify for a paper in an RGB transaction journal, uh, that's that's not sufficient. What we would like to understand is what was that uh, that challenge in applying deep neural network to this problem, and how this challenge was overcome, and that what makes a contribution for an application paper. Uh, it does not need to be. Uh, a new algorithm that we evaluated it on 50,000 uh, benchmarks <laughs> uh, and it improved the performance. Uh, it needs to be something that has advanced the field, whether it's a computational bottleneck in the application that has been solved, whether it is a modification of the algorithm that the application required particular modifications uh, that are justifiable uh, uh, in, in, with evidence, uh, and whether this application could be an application with significant uh, 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 socioeconomic impacts. And we're also particularly interested in uh, applications which are tough, that is, that social application, papers uh, uh, about ethics, trust, transparency, explainability. Uh, taking an evolutionary computation algorithm, uh, evolutionary computation, you know that I work, I, I, I work still in evolutionary computation and it's really my favorite, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, algorithm. 
to me, evolutionary computation is not a black box. Evolutionary computation, every operator has a meaning uh, and, and potentially explaining, you know, the meaning could explain uh, 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 the inferencing that evolutionary computation is doing. So I think, I think there are so many opportunities. I'm not sure if uh, I have answered uh, your, your question, but uh, obviously we can talk offline and we can expand on that. Uh, uh, in, in more details. Okay, thank you, thank you very thank much, you. Professor. Thank you. Thank you. We received lots of questions, so I have to uh, go quicker. The next question is from Zi Hui. Would you like to say something? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you, Professor Albert. Thank you for your very excellent uh, like speech. Um, I, I have a question about that. Uh, I, I just working on EC for many years. So I just think that in your in our new transaction on AI, how do you think about the work from EC F uh, fuzzy system and uh, neural neural networking? Uh, because uh, mm, how do you think that uh, the EC in the AI action, uh, the 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 law of EC in AI? The, uh, Yes, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Zhang, and uh, uh, good, good, good to see you. Uh, the evolutionary computation is an integral part. I see it as an integral part of artificial intelligence, uh, similar to uh, artificial neural network, similar to uh, fuzzy systems, similar to uh, uh, logic and uh, classic logic and planning and knowledge representation. I think, I think, I think AI we can't really. Uh, 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 exclude uh, any of uh, the technologies that we have in the AI field uh, in, 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 in our scope of what artificial intelligence is. Uh, within the transaction, obviously there are other transactions which are dedicated, for example, in evolutionary computations, there are, there's a transaction dedicated in fuzzy systems, there's a transaction dedicated in neural network, and the editor and chiefs uh, coordinate uh, among themselves and we really talk to each other and so on. Uh, uh, so evolutionary computation, I see it as an integral part, uh, 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 similar to other uh, technologies of AI uh, within uh, the transaction of AI. Uh, I, think, I think the type of paper would be looking for uh, needs to present the EC technique within the context of artificial intelligence, uh, contribution to, uh, 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 to the field of AI. So I would say, for example, if we're looking at a paper that designed a new uh, EC algorithm that is uh, uh, very competitive on, uh, 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 on uh, nonlinear uh, or PEC 2019 or 2020, whatever uh, 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 benchmark, I think that paper would be more appropriate to go to the transaction on evolutionary computation. Uh, a paper which could be using uh, evolutionary computation to design a recommender system, uh, that, that, that paper would be very much welcomed uh, in the transaction on AI because, because uh, there's a clear connection between, uh, between evolutionary computation and, 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 and the field of artificial intelligence. In the same way, when we talk about, you know, a paper in, on, on calculus, uh, whether does calculus within, fall within AI, uh, obviously, if, if I have a paper which is using calculus to demonstrate conversions, for example, of a knowledge-based system or, or a neural network, uh, then it, it has relevance. But a paper just on calculus uh, might be suitable in other, uh, in, 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 other, in other journals. I hope I have answered your question. It's not an easy question. Uh, yeah. uh, a very difficult question, and, and it's one of the questions that we are struggling with uh, when we start looking at Bebo and evaluating the problems of transaction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Huh. Thank you, Professor. And because of time, I will pick up only one question uh, for you. Uh, you. The question is, with recent growth of hardware development, there is a discrepancy between AI algorithm applications uh, deployment in the real world. Uh, one of the challenges existing data sets we are using are not able to catch up AI algorithms to make good use, realistic uses. 
So how to define we are fitting good data sets to the AI systems, how we can improve source of data sets? Oh, that's a fantastic question um, that my answer would be limited with, uh, with, with, with the time. Uh, and I'm conscious that we are 15 minutes over time. Uh, there, are, uh, there are obviously different ways of improving the data sets that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, are available to us. Um, but that, that will depend on the application. That will depend on lots of other uh, uh, dimensions. Uh, let me let me take uh, something like you know I talked about today the auto encoder paper that I talked about today. Um, that's one way to improve the data set because in uh, even if you get realistic data sets, you'll have missing values, you'll have uh, uh, missing segments in the data. So if you use this type of data set by excluding, for example, these missing values and missing segments, you end up with a data set which is. Uh, as, as, as realistic as you can get to reality. However, it's incomplete. So now, even when you design your AI algorithms on this data set, uh, you may end up with an algorithm that is not going to be transferable to the actual application that you have. So that is, that is as close as you can get to reality. Um, I'm not talking about you know, a very much artificial data set that uh, is used for benchmarking, for example. In a situation like that, uh, there are uh, things like this paper that I mentioned using this uh, generalized autoencoder uh, that you could actually use uh, to, uh, 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 to leverage the, uh, the data that are missing values, uh, that have missing values in your data set. So the question really is why the data is, uh, 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 is insufficient. If that's because it is not representative of the data set that we have in reality, uh, if that's because you don't have access to the data set in reality and it's a black box and now you would like to develop an algorithm and implement it inside this black box, if that's because the data that you have uh, is highly uh, uh, noisy or has been biased in certain ways, is that because the data that you have has missing values, is that because you did not capture all the, uh, 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 the, the variables uh, in, 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 in the problem is that's because the data has been processed and you got access to the processed data. There are so many reasons when we talk about data mining uh, and many people on, 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 on this call would be aware of that, that can cause this deviation between the data that you are using as a researcher and the data that exists in reality. And it's, it's, it's a case by case solution. Uh, but there are many ways that we can handle once we identify what is the real problem that we are faced with uh, in, in taking the data, in taking the model to, uh, uh, to a situation uh, with different characteristics for whom uh, the data that we, we train the model on. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think this is um, um, the end of the, the talk for today. Uh, let us thank Professor Abbas uh, for the talk and uh, also appreciate all the audience uh, to participate very actively uh, with uh, lots of questions. If any questions are not answered yet, uh, probably we'll, we'll do it uh, uh, in, in the offline way. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you, Professor Abbas. Uh, uh, we, we will look forward to seeing you soon uh, in other events in, in Poly U. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have, have a lovely day. Take care. Thank you. Thank, bye thank bye. you again. Yeah. Thank Hope you. To welcome you to Hong Kong in the very near future. Thank you. The same. Thank you. You're very much welcome in Australia. Have a lovely day. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.